Whenever I read or hear something about the footprint, it's always about how we should limit ourselves. What we should not do, no new clothes, no air travel, no meat, and so on. Such a concept is not very attractive. Who wants to forgo all the good and funny things? Monica, you are completely right. This doesn't sound very attractive. Here it is important to contrast the sacrifice with something positive. I'll give you two examples. Studying means giving up a lot, free time, having less money, but we do it because we expect we will get back something, an interesting job, a subject that excites us. We also give up a lot to stay fit and healthy. We do sport, work out, eat healthily, voluntarily, because we get something in return. The same idea applies to the footprint. We have to contrast the restrictions with enjoyment, experiencing and marveling nature and active participation in a community. We have to look for things uh, that make fun. Less resources, more quality of life is probably a formula. Perhaps the current discussion about a better work-life balance is an opportunity for this. Let's move on to the topic of Sussmind, spirituality and ethics. This is about fundamental debates, about points of view. Why do we need such a concept with dry matter of fact numbers, which on the top of it are also subject to a heated debate? Isn't it about a fundamental discourse about justice, about a meaningful and a good life? The ecological footprint offers an excellent learning opportunity, especially in cooperation with ethic lessons to address issues of justice in a classroom. Examples of questions include, where should we allow, who should be allowed to fly in the future? Persons with a lot of money or persons who want to visit their relatives or who? Should someone who lives in the countryside be allowed to drive a car more than city dwellers? This is where justice becomes concrete and not abstract, not distant from life. Such discussions lead to a different view and therefore to new perspectives. 20 years ago, uh, Swiss graphic artist Manuela Pfundner created Natopia an atlas for a fair and distribution of the world. Based on the concept of the ecological footprint, she, she sketched a picture. Yeah. Of a completely just world. Instead of our well-known familiar map, this atlas shows a grid of eight billion squares distributed as islands across the ocean. Such a world would undoubtedly be fairer, but would this utopian world be worth living for? Does it not make our world fascinating that people are living in the mountains, others in the cities, or at the sea? Fontna herself speaks of an apocalypse of justice. It's very important to realize that we all are different, that we have different needs. Uh, and we have to think about it, that this is a chance. The examination of such a vision makes us aware of how unequally resources are distributed. At the same time, 
this vision emphasizes that we have different needs and that variety and diversity is very important. People in the north or in the mountains are more likely to eat meat and dairy products because they come from their environment. That's okay. And it is important that the region remains lively. The great systems researcher Frederick Wester once attempted, a, attempted to calculate the value of a tree. For the timber trade, the tree is worth around 2,000 euros. But for the general public, a tree is much more valuable. It stores water, filters the air, humidifies and cools it. It produces oxygen, creates fertile soil. So ultimately, it has a high value for the quality of life. Vesta says that a machine that provides such a service should cost at least 207,000 euros. But does such comparison help us? Another very good question. Here we have the need to look again on the three dimensions of sustainability. Economy, ecology, and social issues. They are often depicted as pillars that support the roof of sustainability. In this picture, the three dimensions are equal in their value. So I can convert the one into another. It is therefore perfectly conceivable to strengthen one pillar, for example, the economy, and expands the other pillars, if the sum is positive. This thinking is known as weak sustainability and it's widespread. Building a factory uh, means that you have the chance for a, a prospering economy, so you may cut down forest. If it is good for business, then the environmental or the social concerns must also take a back. On the other hand, there is a so-called strong sustainability concept. It states that the dimensions are not equal, but that nature and natural resources are the basis. They support society and enable its social development. This economy, in turn, is supported by society. It is a part of society. According to this model, nature as a basis, underlying below the uh, social uh, part, and economy on the third level as part of our social community, uh, shows that you cannot substitute nature by economic growth. This makes a big difference. At the end, it's about opening our eyes. Where does our lifestyle have a negative impact on nature and on others? And then it's about prioritizing. What can we change? What is affecting? The concept of the footprint helps us to do this. But just being good is not good enough. We also have to look at how we can develop our societies. It's important to think about this. We need to talk about values, about justice. And finally, we need room for imagination and creativity. These are major challenges that require strength, energy, and confidence. We all need such sources of strength. For some, it's their family or their friends. For others, it's the experience of nature. And for still others, spirituality is such a source. There's nothing more to add. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Let's sum it up. 
A turnaround is possible if we consume fewer resources and, above all, fewer fossil fuels, and if we get involved with a smaller footprint and a bigger handprint.